So our uh, next speaker in this session, the last one in this session, is Elizabeth Kahn, who, uh, whose title on the programme is Towards an Account of Duties to Prevent Future Injustice. Thank you. Yeah, um, the change of title is roughly to do with I was trying to make sure I was bang on message for the conference, as I'm sure everyone does. And the towards is because I'm like, crap, does it work or not? So it's always good to put towards in the title to show that you, you, you're open to the suggestion. You might not be 100% perfect yet. Um, but what my project is, is that I'm very interested in Irish Young's social connection, account of responsibility um, with regards to structural injustice. And what the project is, is I'm trying to think through it, think through it systematically, think about whether, how it can be justified and how it can be understood. Um, and trying like, sort of to tie it down a little bit more, because I think there's some really good ideas there, but I'd quite like it to be a little bit more specific. I'd like to know, for example, what precisely is social connection, and why does it ground duties? So this paper is a bit longer than the presentation. In the paper, I also talk about what um, f um, shared responsibility and my doubts about that and my replacement of it with... Um, collectivization duties and I also talk a little bit about um, my worries that come from the Martha Nussbaum critique which is at the, in the preface to the book which is the worry about how you cannot take blame out of the account if at time zero you don't act um, at time two you can be blamed for not acting right? so you can't always be forward looking and I might pick up on that depending on time as we go through but to keep it simple, today what I'm really interested in is thinking about, right, what is social connection to structural injustice and why might that justify an obligation to take action? Right, so um, I'm going to draw attention to an ambiguity in Young's approach. I'm going to try and produce an account that defines what social connection is and explains why social connection can ground moral duties to work with others to lessen ongoing structural injustice. I'm going to investigate whether this account works when we sort of think about it from a contractualist framework. So if we think about what can be reasonably rejected, does this work, is the question. And in doing so, I'm going to pick up on some ideas that are very similar to the stuff Rob Judd wrote about when he's thinking about backward-looking um, uh, causality stuff. Um, and it's, it's very similar, and it, it's interesting. Right. Okay. So, social structure. Now, I really want to get this clear because I always get questions about this. When I say social structure, I'm not talking about a set of organisations, okay? Nor am I talking about a set of coercively imposed practices. When I'm talking about social structure, I'm following the sort of Irish Young, AJ Julius approach, which is more coming from sort of sociology. So what we've got here is sociologists use the concept of structure to understand how a society works and how it treats different individuals. The social structural analysis examines how society divides populations into social groups with different expectations, opportunities, and treatment over time. So this is a social structure is something that persists over time. But the difficulty about that is I think that it changes and it emerges over time. But there's got to be some sort of sense of persistence. There's got to be some idea that these relations, say a problematic set of relations, aren't just here one minute and then gone. There's got to be this idea that there's, there's a systematic and ongoing problem for something to be a structural injustice. So social structure, Jan says, is a particular way of viewing the whole of society rather than a specific part of it. So when we do social structural analysis, is we look at how society is sort of systematically, sort of God's eye view, and we evaluate it in some sense. Um, okay, and yeah, so instead of talking about social structures, which people quite often do, I'm going to be talking about social structure as a whole, so thinking about a system, right? And, and I can talk more about this later if I have to. Okay, so Young defines structural injustice as occurring when social processes put large groups of persons under systematic threat of domination or deprivation of the means to develop and exercise their capacities, at the same time as these same processes enable others to dominate or have a wide range of opportunities for developing capacities available to them. So it's sort of comparative, and it's about vulnerability to deprivation and domination. But what I wanted to do was take that and be a little bit more general. I don't want to have to commit to a particular account at this stage. So instead I want to say, um, in many social scenarios, a social group can be identified as occupying an inferior, in some sense, position, right? So when there is that sort of inequality, and it can't be justified, so it's a systematic inequality that cannot be justified, then um, this is uh, structural injustice. 
And then, of course, the, the beef here comes from what can and can't be justified. Right? So I wanted to keep it a bit more open. Okay. Right. So... Young's got a social connection account of responsibility, forward-looking responsibility, with regards to structural injustices. She says she assigns responsibility for the task of lessening structural injustice to all those socially connected to structural injustice. Right? And she says, okay, so it's more like role-based responsibility than liability. So she says, I'm thinking about a task going forward. So she's talking about assigning responsibility to take action. Right? And that's why she wants to separate it from liability. Um, she says it's not isolating her account. She wants to say that it can be shared. So just because I have to do this task doesn't mean that you don't have to do it as well. She says it's primarily forward-looking. So although we might look to the past to identify social connection, she says we're talking about a task going forward. Um, and she talks about an essentially shared responsibility because she follows, I think it's Larry May, and saying the difference between collective and shared responsibility. So she says you have it in awareness that others have it, and you sort of have it together. And she says it can only be discharged through collective action. So that's a very quick version of her account, right? Just to give you an idea about. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at it systematically, and then I'm, a, I'm thinking about what works and what doesn't, and I'm making my own account. Right, so how does Young define social connection? So she says this shared forward-looking responsibility goes to all those socially connected to the structural injustice. And she talks about social connection in a number of different ways. And the problem with this is, not only, it's not that it selects a different group, but it's the fact that the reason it seems to be giving for selecting the group is different depending on which of the three we look at. Right? It seems to me that it changes things. And so sometimes she talks about people contributing to processes that produce unjust outcomes. So she's talking about when practices come together with, say, trends or norms or unconscious biases to put somebody in this disadvantaged position. Right? Um, she's saying that contributing to these processes that then come together to cause this problem is a social connection. And that's the one she draws on most often, I think. She also says, which is really interesting, which is something I want to investigate later, is belonging to a system of interdependent processes of cooperation and competition through which we seek benefits and aim to realise projects. And she talks then about when you're part of such a system, you can make claims, and when you're part of that system, you have to kind of have this shared responsibility to meet those claims. And I quite like that idea, and I think there's a lot of mileage there. But it's interesting that it picks up on both benefit and participation in a really interesting way. And I think that's something that really needs to be explored. But then she doesn't talk about that one half as much as the first one. And the problem with the second one is also, when she talks about social structure, it also includes things that are sort of subconscious or amalgamations or systematic stuff that's not an explicit practice. And this one doesn't seem to capture people who contribute to those processes because they're not practices that we self-consciously join. When I'm unconsciously sexist and on a panel I judge the woman more harshly in a job interview, I'm not, in a, I'm not consciously stepping into a social practice, and yet it looks like I'm contributing to a structural injustice, something that causes people to be put into different positions where they're subject to disadvantage that's unjustifiable. So this one's not really going to capture everything that goes into social structure. So that's part of the reason I'm not looking at that one today, but I think it's something very interesting. And the third one is she just talks about dwelling within a social structure, and that just seems to be quite passive. It seems to be just by being under it, we are socially connected. And I'm not really sure how that one's going to get any mileage. We could think about being in a certain position as being, I don't know, pregnant with responsibility in some sense, but I thought less about that one. Today I'm going to think most mostly about the first one. Um, great. So, so the first one seems to be roughly about causally contributing to a process that causally contributes to an outcome. So it's some sort of indirect causal connection. So she discusses contributing to processes that produce unjust outcomes, and it's the one she talks about most, and for the reasons I've just talked about, it's the one I'm going to think about today. So, why might causal connection matter? And I want to think about why might causal connection matter for assigning duties coming forward. And if you remember, these structural injustice are something that persists over time. And I thought one of the best ways to make sense of this, given that she's so against the liability account, she's really against the idea that what's happening is you were being um, asked to do something or given costs because you caused a problem in the background, right? It's not about that. So what could it be? What are these connections? What is this causal connection? And I thought maybe if we thought about going forward, 
right? If we thought about the fact that I'm likely to contribute to a structural injustice going forward rather than the fact that I've contributed in the past, we might be able to get some legway in trying to understand why social connection can ground this responsibility, right? Because she's constantly talking about how causally contributing doesn't make me responsible, outcome responsible for causing something. So it can't be that, right? It can't be that I have this duty not to contribute to structural injustices. Because that would mean, and it can't be that, because that seems to suggest that if I am connected to them, I'm in some sense liable, and she really rejects that. So instead, we could think about reasonable precautions, is what I'm saying. So what we could be saying is the reason that you have to work with others now to prevent future structural injustice and to lessen structural injustice is because this is a precaution you take, right? So it looks like when I'm worried about causing a problem in the future, one of the things I can be asked to do is to reduce the chance of either that happening or reduce the chance of that being sort of deadly or terrible. So if I'm going to set up a fireworks display, it looks like there are certain precautions I take up front, both to reduce the likelihood of an accident and reduce the severity of an accident that occur. And I think in the same way, the sort of action she's asking us to go take, the sort of political action which involves working with others to try and lessen structural injustice, could be seen as a precaution to prevent our future contribution to injustice. And this is sort of calling on a common sense duty to explain why social connection can justify the kind of duty she's talking about. Right, so I'm hoping that this can do the work. I'm thinking that this sort of common sense duty explains why social connection can ground duties to work with others to try and lessen these ongoing structural injustices. So, according to this account, efforts to lessen ongoing structural injustice are precautions that agents must take in order to reduce their chances of contributing to significant structural injustice. And this seems to work because I think we can say, I have a duty to take precautions without saying at T2, if the bad thing happens, I'm responsible for it happening. So say I take precautions, I go on a march to try and improve gay rights in Britain, for example, but votes go the wrong way and things don't change. It looks like I've still taken the precautions, it's just that they haven't paid off in this circumstance. So I'm not blameworthy. However, those that didn't take precautions to prevent the structural injustice in the future can be blamed at time T2 for not taking the precautions. They can't be blamed for the structural injustice, but they can be blamed for not fulfilling their political duty. And this meets the, the Nussbaum problem. Um, how are we doing for time? You have a good five minutes. Okay, great. So, I'm hoping that this will do the work I wanted to do. But then I thought, well, how do we know whether this really works? How do we know whether there really is this duty of reasonable precautions in cases like these? Because cases like these are slightly strange, if you think about them. Because they're strange in the fact that often the processes that lead to structural injustice are things that we can't be asked not to contribute to anymore for several reasons. So one reason might be because a lot of these processes are things that we have to do to live a decent life and it would be unreasonable to ask us not to, right? Another reason is that lots of these processes actually cause a lot of benefit and it would, be, it would actually make things worse not to keep contributing. So given these odd states of affairs, um, it seems odd that we get reasonable precautions because of this. So I, if I wanted to test it a bit more, I thought about thinking about um, contractualism, right? So um, we might want to say that we might want to take like Scanlonian contractualism and see whether right, this duty I'm proposing can be reasonably rejected. So this might be a bit of a test to see whether the duty works. So can it be reasonably rejected? So my first thought was... No, no, because it looks like, and this, this approach proposes that all have duties effectively, right? Because it turns out that structural injustice is such a complex causal nexus that it looks like none of us can guarantee that we're not going to contribute. So it looks like we've all got to take these precautions. So it looks like what this is actually saying is we've all got these duties. Right? And then Iris Young talks about on what basis they might be stronger or weaker. And she talks about things like the plausible things she talks about, the best things she talks about, are things like how much power we have within a system and also how much we're privileged by a system. And she thinks that greater burdens can be taken up by people who have more power and more privilege. Right? So it looks like it's hard to reject this account in favour of something else because, of course, according to the contractual framework, I can only reasonably reject something if I can propose a better alternative which doesn't burden anyone worse than this one. Right? So it looks like this is really going to work. But then if we think about some of like Rob Jubb's work, he says, well, well he doesn't say this, but we, it follows a similar line. Right? We could say, well, instead, let's like, take a step back and say, well, why do people have to take precautions? 
in these sort of cases. It doesn't make sense to say that those who are likely to contribute should take precautions rather than just saying there's a general duty. Why don't we just say there's a general duty to promote justice and prevent structural injustice? Why is it that this sort of causal connection going forwards can ground a precautionary duty? We might say that precautionary duties only make sense in certain very specific circumstances. So we might want to think more abstractly. We might want to say, um, so uh, imagine an alternative universe in which we know who's going to be connected to a structural injustice in the future. This account in that alternative world would say those people have the duties and not others. But when we think about whether they can reasonably reject the duties, they could say well, there's an alternative system where we share the duties equally, right? Or we share the duties according to some other metric rather than according to this one, in which case people will be burdened less. So because instead of 10 people, for example, sharing the duties, there are 20 and the burdens are less. So it looks like, according to the Scanlonian thing, the largest objection is smaller, effectively, right? So why is it that it's a general duty? Why is it not a general duty? Why is it a specific duty? on those who are going to contribute towards the fu in the future, right? And to do that, we'd need some sort of reason. We could say, well, you're less burdened because you're a contributor than if we did it generally, even though your burden is larger, because somehow being a contributor is, is offsetting in some sense. But at the moment, I can't think of a reason for that. So this is my worry, and this is what I'd like some help with. So, finishing up, um, so ways forward. We could come up with a reason that justifies assigning duties on the basis of likely future contribution. So we could say there is a reason why the group of 10 people who are likely future contributors should share the burden rather than the 20 if we just make it a general duty. We might be able to think of some sort of reason, and if you can think of any, that would be really nice. Um, alternatively, it could be that there is something wrong with this abstracting away from the actual case. We could just say, well, in reality, you know, right now, Oh, I mean, because there's something fishy going on if we abstract from the fact that we all actually don't know if we're going to be connected and therefore we all have to take the precaution. But we don't abstract away from the fact that in these sorts of cases there are good reasons not to stop contributing. It seems like we're doing half the abstraction. I think there might be something funny going on there that I need to think about. Alternatively, we go back and think about this participating with the aim of benefiting approach that was like number two out of three. We could go back and try and see if we can make Irish Jones' approach work that way. Or we could think about maybe just assigning duties on the basis of privilege, like extra duties on the basis of privilege. So one general duty to prevent future injustice, another one based on privilege. That might work out. And that, that's how she actually wants to assign the strength of the duties. But then we're losing social connection to a certain extent. And social connection is part of what made the account, um, um, I want to say sexy, but that's not right. Um, the thing that made the account attractive, right? <laughs> so it seems to, I'm sorry for that conflation. Uh, it seems to me that the identifying the social processes that cause structural injustice is a huge part of Young's account. It's saying, look, not only is this person in a terrible situation, but this person is in a terrible social situation which we all contribute to, and we contribute to the continuation of. And that seems really important, because what she's doing is she's saying, this is a sort of relational injustice. It's not a cosmic injustice that people are sort of sceptical about. This really is your business, right? And I think she thinks it's important that we don't forget that. And I think that's part of her push to move towards this sort of account rather than a distributional approach, right? And I think, though, she doesn't need to maintain social connections for that. What you could say is, right, this is a structural injustice, right? Um, but we assign precautionary duties to it universally. Or we do based on benefit or privilege. But just because it matters that it's socially caused when we're identifying the injustice as a social injustice, right, rather than a cosmic injustice, just because that matters doesn't mean that we need to go all the way and say it's the causal connection that should, is the basis on which we have duties to prevent the continuance of this problem. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so let me just uh, write the same sort of uh, uh, sequence as last time to begin with anyway, so Sabah to begin with. And if you haven't identified yourself already, uh, do so please. Should I begin? Yeah, please. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, was, that was pretty interesting. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the, the, okay. there's two sorts of issues that you raise with respect to precautionary duties. One is an epistemic issue, so that given that none of us knows whether he or she is going to be the one who actually contributes to social injustice, 
what sort of duties do we have? And another sort of issue you raise is what relevance at all does, it, does the fact that I might causally contribute to a social injustice have in determining what duties I should bear? And with respect to the second, one way to try and answer that is by adverting to the claim that individuals have duties to internalize the costs of their own existence. So the idea is that if a gust of wind picks me up and throws me towards you, and, and, and you know, no fault of my own, and it's going to impose particular harms on you, and there are two ways to advert this harm. One is by imposing a defensive harm on me, and the other is by imposing a defensive harm on, on uh, Philip, that the better uh, target of the defensive harm is on me, because I have a duty, as I mentioned, to make it so that my existence doesn't make things go worse for other people. And that might be a way to ground the relevance of the fact that uh, individuals, insofar as that they, are, they might turn out to cause, actually be an element in what contributes to the social injustice, might have a special duty to, uh, to, to take up uh, precautionary aims and uh, goals. Yes. So that's, that, doesn't, that doesn't solve the epistemic problem, but the idea is to try to provide the ground for the relevance of causation. Brilliant. No, um, that's fantastic. Really good question. And it, it means that I actually must have explained it. So um, the first part about not knowing whether we're going to contribute to structural injustice, I think that that means that we have to take the precautions. I think if you don't know if you're going to do something really terrible or not, right, or really significant or not, you, you err on the side of caution, I think. Right? And, that, and that's how I'm going to try and get over that problem. Either that or you have to investigate further. And that's the other option, right? You might investigate and find that some of your behaviours are contributing to sort of structural sexism, for example, in which case you might want to change or try and cultivate new norms, which is sort of form of the sort of action that I'm recommending. Um, so investigate more and be careful. So err on the side of caution, I would say. The second one, right, so individuals have a duty to internalise the cost of their own existence. So we have to pay for our own externalities. So this is a really good common sense principle that we, it's got a lot of intuitive pull. It's the same as the, it's what backs up the precautionary idea, right? I have to take precautions to stop externalities pushing on other people. The problem is when we use the contractualist framework to see whether this is a duty or not, or whether this is a principle or not, it seems like it, it, it might not be. Because what really matters when we look at things from the contractualist perspective is, is it fair and is it efficient? If it's fair and efficient to make people pay for their externalities, we should, right? But if it's not, then we shouldn't. And I don't know what reason for thinking that it's fair and efficient to make people who are likely to contribute in the future absorb the costs in these sorts of cases. I mean, I, th I think it is fair and efficient to divide them in the way that Young says, and, and I think it actually means everyone has the duty, so that, that's, that is fair and that is efficient. But if we think about the principle itself, it says, it's the externalities principle, I don't think there's any justification for that in contractualism in all cases. Yeah, well, I'm not worried about the aftermath. So if it turns out that you never actually contributed, it was ex post, and you uh, ended up taking a precautionary measure, um, I, am I owed something? I see what you mean. Um, if ex post you didn't contribute, that might be because it's avoided. But I suppose you're thinking about a case where you sort of take action to prevent structural racism, right, of some kind. You join a march of some sort, or you petition, or whatever. We make a political change. Um, and then you realise that all along you weren't being subconsciously racist. You weren't contributing to any racial problems. So it, it, it was solved. But even if it had happened, you wouldn't have contributed. Exactly. I'm not really sure you, will, you can ever actually have that knowledge. But, but afterwards, supposing that even afterwards, right? I mean, it's really hard to have that sort of coma. counterfactual knowledge. But you that's went to a coma, you were, you were injured. There's just no way you could have contributed. Oh, you that's know, you good. You went into a march, and then you, you got it. Mm -hmm. But you contributed before you were in the coma, surely. Well, 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 yeah, I think we. we but um, uh, but whether it's whether it, oh yeah, you probably weren't allowed to come back. We'll yeah. talk about it later. Okay, so mm -hmm. Philip. So the question I threw is goes back to I think your exchange with Robert Job this morning, right? Mm. Um, so, suppose the following situation obtains. There's, there's a structure in, let's say, Irish society, um, due to laws, due to whatever, patterns and so on, whereby we who are Irish-born, right, can avail ourselves of opportunities to harm or exploit or whatever those of 
you who are unlucky enough not to be Irish born, right? <laughs> Imagine that's the structure in place. Now, I'm a good person, let's suppose, and so what I do is I don't avail myself of these opportunities. Um, I, in that sense, don't do injustice, as you say, or contribute to social injustice. But actually, even if all of us who are Irish uh, do not avail ourselves of these opportunities, it's still the case that the non-Irish are suffering an injustice because they're enjoying, so to speak, are not availing ourselves these opportunities as a function simply of good luck, the fortune that those of us who are Irish are actually rather nicely disposed. In order to enjoy justice, for you to enjoy justice, you, it's not just enough that you happen not to be, say, exploited or harmed, you've got to be robustly protected against that sort of exploitation. That's why I always worried with used to talk to Iris Manning about, 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 uh, about this material, that it sort of focuses too much on the, I mean, it's perfectly, it's a great thing that we don't exploit these opportunities to harm others. But that doesn't, in itself, mean that they're enjoying structural justice. In order to enjoy structural justice, they've got to be robustly protected against, robustly avoid that sort of, and, okay, so you, you see the, the yeah. point. So I'm sort of worried about, and there's, a, there's an ambiguity. You talked about what we who do avail ourselves, we contribute to social injustice. I would say if we do avail ourselves these opportunities to exploit, we certainly impose the costs associated with there being social injustice on, on, on others. Okay, so I definitely I think this is the bit. question you asked this morning of Robert when you said mm. there was an ambiguity. Does this constitute injustice? Exactly. It, so yeah, or does it deliver injustice. I, I, I'm with him, at least I think I'm with him, in thinking that uh, justice requires, and yeah, I've, I've said so, yeah. So, right, the first part I completely understand, the second part I don't quite understand and I'll try. So the first part, right, in Irish Young Eyes work, the way I interpret it, there's a huge, like, distinction between justice and morality. So justice is about judging social structures. Morality is judging the actions of agents. So if I, if somebody comes to my restaurant and um, I discriminate against them because they're ginger, it's not injustice, it's immorality, which I think was um, Simon's example from my Bible, but never mind. It's not injustice, it's, um, it's immoral, but it's not unjust, because injustice is about systematic problems, right? So what happens here is it's not, we, 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 want, we want to say somebody's vulnerable when there's a systematic problem. So when I stop being racist, there's still a systematically racist society. So just because I don't avail myself of the opportunity to impose my racial superiority on one occasion, that doesn't mean that there's not still a, a race problem in the fact that I could. So when somebody That's isn't sexist to me, that doesn't change that. But the thing is, systematic things are made up of little individual things. So if enough of us do change our racist attitudes, we will no longer have the power, right, in a sense. So actually this normative change over this a normative change rather than a legal change could actually secure people from being vulnerable in this way. It could secure them from the systematic injustice. So it's a funny account because it's it's somewhere partway between the idea that we need the formal protection of the state so that we're not relying on goodwill and the idea that the individual, yeah. all that matters is what the individual does. And I think, I think it works because I was really concerned because I do think you're right, it, it has to be systematic. And for Irish Young, that's why the action that we must take is political. It must try and change the system, yeah. either through norms or through political change. But I agree norms can be changed from the bottom up. Yeah, yeah exactly. that, that is possible, I agree. So if enough of us change it, we do stop the person being dominated. But if one of us, it's funny. Is that, you don't want to, 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 to address the second part of it? How, does that work with the second part or not? Because it... I think so, but there are others. In okay, the okay. Case, so. Well, we might come back to it. Okay. Uh, uh, Andy. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, you have a, a very subtle view, and I might be missing some of the subtleties, but I still don't get how uh, your uh, reconstruction or revision of Young addresses Nussbaum's problem. And I'd like to get at my puzzlement by flipping the top of the hypothetical basically upside down. So imagine that I've led a very sexist, racist uh, life up to now. Um, and um, uh, uh, and suppose 
uh, 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 nothing. It, it's completely implausible to think that I, I've met any reasonable duty to um, uh, correct the, uh, these injustices. Okay. So, uh, and, uh, and now I have a heart attack. Okay. So, and now, um, what, uh, I haven't taken any reasonable precautions about the future. Okay. In fact, the future just seems completely irrelevant. I'm now dead, uh, suppose, okay. and, uh, 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 and I have violated my duty uh, based on what I've, uh, what I've done in the past. Not because I haven't taken reason reasonable precautions about the future, okay, but because you know, in the past I acted in certain ways, and now I'm no longer I'm no longer around to take reasonable precautions. Now it seems to me that sort of your account is really parasitic on the fact that uh, I've violated duties in the past because the, what uh, what puts uh, uh, me under a uh, so put it this way, if I'm, uh, if I've never made fireworks before, and now I've just started making fireworks, then I'm under a reasonable, uh, under a duty to take reasonable precautions in making fireworks. But that doesn't seem to be parallel at all with the case that I'm describing. I have been making fireworks all along, okay, uh, and part of my making the fireworks has been to contribute and participate in a system of uh, injustice, and I've done nothing to stop that. So it seems to me that the reasonable precaution account is really parasitic on some prior uh, under, uh, 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 some prior conception of a duty which is independent of the reasonable precautions, and it's that duty that I violated up to time t, up to now. Which would be the duty not to be racist or sexist, or the duty the, the, not to create the duty injustice? To, the duty to take action in mitigation of the structural injustices in my society. So, I, so right, okay, let's judge this person who's just died. It seems to me at like T10, um, when they were an adult, so T21 or something, mm -hmm. they had a precautionary duty, right? They didn't take it up. So like T30, we can say, yep, they're already guilty of not taking precautions for a long time. They're also sort of guilty for doing lots of interactional, immoral actions, but that's irrelevant for our justice account. For our, our account of in what respects have they violated their moral duties with regard to ensuring justice, right? Their precautionary duty to prevent future injustice. They failed. Then we get T30. They, they, failed, they failed the whole way through. So when we look back, we can say they consistently didn't fulfill their precautionary duties, which are to take political action to stop um, racism and sexism. The, the problem is, I think it's very hard to say that, so we can say that they failed to take the political action they should have. And we can also say that they did a lot of interactional harms and wrongs. But what we can't say, Irish Chan says, and I agree, is that they were responsible for the fact that America was racist in those years, if it was America, right? We can't say that because that's too difficult. We can't, it, it, it's too difficult to make that claim. We can't back it up. But what we can say is they did nothing, they contributed to racism and did nothing to prevent it. They knew they were going to continue contributing and they still did nothing to prevent it. Right, and I, I, that's all I want to say too. So I don't see where you need the precaution thing. They, they, because we they, cannot say. They, they didn't do anything to prevent it. Like they, they contributed to it, they didn't do anything to prevent it. End of story. Yeah, so, but so I just don't want to call it offsetting because I just don't think you can offset injustice. I just don't think that's possible. What you can do is either prevent it from happening or not prevent it from happening. So there are three time slices. We can look to the past and you can't hold anyone really responsible for causing something. You can only tell them responsible for what they did themselves. We can look now and say um, maybe your precautions should be simultaneous because then they can stop the racism coming out, but I'm not sure that will work. That's more sort of Thomas Pogger's idea of like, you know, the wind's going this way, so you go this way and it compensates somehow. I'm, I'm not sure how it works. Or we can look forward and we can say, you know, you, you're, you're likely to contribute in the future and you can do something now to stop that happening. Um, I think my account, though, hasn't really thought about the racist on purpose Injust per, like the person contributing to injustice on purpose. I was more thinking of the people who sort of contribute to the sort of state who they actually hate, right? And then it's like, well, in these cases, you know.
we don't want to say they were responsible for anything. Could you say could you say your name? Um, then we've got this participating and with the aim of benefiting, and then we've got dwelling. So she talks about all three, and what I was doing was taking one and thinking about whether we can make a sensible account out of one. It will be another project to think about the other two. I thought it would be crazy to try and do all of them. Um, the second one... Um, wait, 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 hang on. But, but so, there would be sensitivity to, to, to the project with different attributes. Right. Um, so then when it comes to assigning, the, so she says, it's the, she says it's social connection that gets you in the game and then deciding how much burden is on you is on the basis of things like power and privilege, collective ability, which just seems another form of power to me, and um, interest, but I think interest is a prudential reason, not a moral reason, so I knocked that out. Um, so, but it, I was just seeing whether I can make one plausible um, and I haven't really talked about the other one. Um, um, do we want a plural account that thinks about the different ways we are involved in social structures and how they might ground duties? Maybe going forward, and something I'll think about. The second one, right, is this overly demanding? So what I've been talking about is a moral obligation to take political action as a precaution to avoid contributing in the future. Um, in the original account, which towards the end I expressed scepticism about, um, is this too demanding? Right, is your question, and I think. When we apply the contractual framework, what we think about is we balance, right, the, the legitimate demand of the victims of structural injustice to have change against the legitimate demand of the non-victims to live a really like nice life free from obligations. And we've got to balance those out in these cases. So you've got to think about the person facing structural disadvantage due to their race. Um, and we've got to balance their interests against the interests of the ordinary sort of hard-working um, citizen, which includes the black citizens as well as the white citizens in my example, who wants to get on with their job and doesn't want to involved in political action. And I think there's a balance here. And what we want is something efficient and fair. And I think what I need is a caveat saying that this obligation to take precautions has to be limited, right, to what's reasonable. But what's reasonable depends on how serious the injustices are that are going on. And there's a balance that's got to go on. And I think, I think those suffering from serious structural injustice could reject anything other than a fairly demanding GT in a lot of circumstances. But we might want to make it nuanced depending on the person's situation when we're judging them. We have four more questions, so um, let's every, uh, I'll, I'll uh, ask everyone to be as succinct as they can, and don't forget to say your names. Uh, so we now have... Yeah. I'm Andrew Conner from Georgia State. I have, I have two terminological questions. The first one, when you were responding to Philip a moment ago, you said that individuals are not 
not capable of, of injustice. You must have meant structural injustice, right? Yeah. No. I mean, according to the way these terminology, individuals can't do injustice. So when I don't pay my landlord the rent on time, I'm not doing an injustice? It's illegal. Okay. I'm not sure I agree with that. That's an interesting move. Uh, the other point is about uh, likely. I wonder if you could say what likely means. Uh, the word appears probably over a hundred times in the paper. Uh, and I'm wondering how we're to understand what that is measuring and whether it's supposed to be accessible to uh, a, a typical agent. Because looking forward, there are many things that are very likely. I could be a vector for Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome when I get on the plane tomorrow, but that's not worrying me too much. But there are many things that I, I might potentially be uh, involved in in some way. And I'm wondering how agents are expected to be able to sort of uh, work with the <coughs> likelihood of that figuring in the paper. Um, yeah, it's a huge problem. I need to read the literature on risking harm, which apparently there's really big literature on, and especially relative to sort of things like climate change, and I need to really engage with that a little bit more. Um, in terms of structural injustice being likely, we can say that structural injustice that is now, we can see it and has persisted up till now, we can see it persisting into the future unless things change in some way. So that likely is going to be more like um, um, foreseeable, right? Foreseeable future structural injustice. But the likely that's going to cause me a problem is that I'm likely to contribute to some form of structural injustice. And I think that's a sort of, it's a probability claim, right? Given that I'm a human being in a causally um, interconnected world, it looks like the idea that I'm not going to be contributing to a process that contributes to a structural injustice is incredibly unlikely, is what I'm trying to say. And that's a sort of, there's a, a probability claim, I guess, and it's something, I don't know, what, I don't know what, what I can add to that. And maybe some sort of, likely just doesn't seem, I need to say, um, fairly, very likely maybe, but, or do you think I need to do some sort of crazy Bayesianism? I, I don't know. I mean, do we need to appeal to the social scientific data to be able to give variable judgments of, of likelihood? Because uh, otherwise there might be significant determinacy problems in figuring out what I should prioritize with my moral intentions. Yeah, like there's all these different structural injustices. Should I contribute to, should I primarily think about the ones that I myself am likely to be caught up in the causal nexus for? Right. This sort of suggests, yeah. And it does take us quite away from Iris Young's original project. Um, two, um, she wanted to be motivational, exactly. She's being very pragmatic. She wants an interjection. She's really worried about the rhetoric as well as the philosophy, and she thinks they're interconnected. And I've got this really big dilemma in my work. Do I want it to be pragmatic and motivational, or do I want it to get it right? And is there a, a gap between them? And I'm pushing towards trying to get it right and be um, philosophically correct, if such a thing exists rather than being motivational, because I think this is motivational, her stuff is motivational and showing that we're connected to it, and I think it's like, look, connection, you have responsibility, and I think that is more motivational than just general duty to promote justice. Um, but I think it's important that we get things right, and if, if on the best moral account that doesn't work, it doesn't work. So I am trying to see whether I can take Young's pragmatic stuff and see if I can show that it has this background. If I was on the street um, giving out leaflets, I would choose my words differently as, when, you know, as I quickly, I mean, come on, it's, when you're actually talking to people, they hate 
I hate the words moral duty. And, um, I need to do need to move back to responsibility because I think what I am talking about is responsibility and I think precautions are responsibilities too. The reason I first shied away from that is because I, I don't like the connection between responsibility and being responsible in the past. And it's unfortunate that in English it's the same word. But I think you're right, it is discretionary and precautions work with it too and I should move back definitely. Thanks. Cool. Uh, okay. oh, sorry. No, you're the last one. Yeah, okay, so you have two more, so you first. Okay, Eric yeah. from Two more, okay. Um, we might agree, so feel free to just tell me to be quiet if, if, if you've already said this, but I'm also going to push on the Nussbaum objection, which never really struck me as all that forceful. It seemed to be a bit of a confusion. Um, the claim that Young is making is simply that not all forms of responsibility require guilt. Um, and so it's, it's an additional form of responsibility that applies to particularly to addressing structural injustices, right? and I think you just said why. Um, that we have a duty to bring X about, right? Regardless of our causation and having um, created in, injustices, say that I'm, say that there's a, a white heterosexual male born in the affluent world, but you know never said anything racist or sexist in his life, still has that res open-ended responsibility to bring X about, uh, living in a society that's racist, sexist, all these things, right? Um, so, I, I just never understood the forcefulness of Nussbaum's objection. So the forcefulness of Nussbaum's objection is, it's, she says it's fine to say, no, but you're not saying you're guilty and therefore you have to do something. But what we have to say is, if we're really saying you have to do something, if it gets turned T10 and you haven't done it, we have to say you're guilty of not doing what you were supposed to do. And she says, because Young doesn't talk about that, but Young doesn't say that that's not... That's not how she wants her account to work, but she does stay quite silent and she does talk a lot about blaming guilt being problematic. She does seem quite quiet on that. Um, yeah, um, but I also pick up in the paper the fact that it's a shared responsibility might cause problems because if, if it's a shared responsibility, as in one we hold and the knowledge that other people hold, does that mean that at time T10 we share guilt in the same way? I'm sure Young would want us to share guilt in the same way because she can't possibly expect me to share guilt with with the group, because if I've genuinely done what I did to try and collectivise and they've been uncooperative, it seems like we can't share guilt. And that's one of the reasons why I want to move to a collectivisation duty from a shared responsibility. Um, okay, last question. Um, so, I have two things to say about precautions. So, the first thing to say about precautions <coughs> is that it's perfectly possible for us to acquire responsibility for bad effects we took precautions against. By the time I jog up in the garden, I don't actually have to If I am jogging and I tie it up in my garden, and I've taken precautions and it nonetheless managed to get over the fence and dig up my neighbor's flower beds, I still have to recompense my neighbor for the dug up flower beds. So we can be responsible, we can hold remedial responsibility for events that we took precautions against. Second, the, normally we take precautions against unusual events. But the whole point, so people don't usually set off fireworks. That's why it's appropriate, that's part of why it's appropriate to take precautions when you do so. But the whole point of Young's social connection model is that it's absolutely quidotian, right? It's not unusual at all. It's happening all the time. So, given first that precautions can generate remedial responsibilities, even when you take them, and that we normally think that you should take precautions against unusual things rather than quidotian things, why would you think that precaution is the appropriate way to think about the Youngian social connection stuff? Okay, so the first one, I actually, I find that normal way of thinking actually a bit problematic. You know when the person is in a car accident and doesn't do anything wrong and yet they're supposedly still sort of causally responsible and liable in some sense, even though we can show that they haven't done anything wrong, whereas somebody else is lucky and the bad outcome doesn't come out. Actually, I really don't like that. And at one point I want to write about the fact that I think that really doesn't work. That's just making people guilty for things that are beyond their control. But I guess it's not guilt, it's liability. But I'm not sure it's an efficient way of doing costs either. Um, right. But, putting that aside for a second, so yeah, I can be called more responsible despite taking precautions. Yeah, I, I don't... Yeah, yeah, people generally think so. But in this case... You see, because... Hmm. No, I get the strength of it, and um, I'll have to think about it. Uh, because the point is, but then maybe we want to, so that might mean we say, right, say, I have to think of a structural justice example. So it's, considering the structural justice I've worked against, but it's still is happening in my society, then I can still be responsible. Um, 
Uh, I mean, I'm not arguing that point. Um, Young does argue that point, and I don't take her up on it. I'm quite happy with it, and I like it, and so I should think about something to support it, because it's something that should be attacked. But I can only do so many things at once. Um, okay, precautions against unusual events. Yeah, exactly, absolutely normal. This is not... So it would be a very funny use of the word precaution. But what I liked about precaution was it explained about how you sometimes do something in order on the... It's, it's some way of how social... How we can, like be connected to something in a way that's morally significant without being blameworthy. But you're saying it doesn't do that work. You're saying, um, I just think it does. I mean, just imagine, like, I go out of my way to stop a dangerous activity. Like, I'm a werewolf and I chain myself up, right? It seems to me that if I go out and, like, savage a few people, but if someone comes around and says, you know, these bars are legit, I think that's fine. Honestly, I just think we've, we've got that one seriously wrong. Um, but yeah, I, I was reaching for precaution, but maybe precaution comes with this baggage that everyone else is against me on. Um, and thank you very much for bringing it up. Um, yeah, but as I say, towards the end, I, I, but for other reasons, I'm worried about whether we can ground it on precaution or whether we're going to have to instead do the split up approach where we say, yes, it is a relational injustice, right? It is a social, it is a structural injustice, and that matters but it's not our connection to it that grounds the duties, which pragmatically would be a disaster, but might turn out being right unless I can think of a reason that fits in, as we said. But now you've given me more reasons to doubt it, which is very helpful. Thank you very much.